I'm back from Orlando. The owners' meetings are over. We have an exciting Eagle Eye podcast presented by Nissan, Ruben Frank, and Dave Zangaro. Rube, how are you? I'm well, Dave. Thanks for asking. Uh, how was your flight back? Uh, the flight itself, well, actually, I, I was going to say the flight itself was fine. It was quite bumpy, uh, a lot of turbulence. But I did, you're right, I, you're alluding to the fact that I had a, a quite lengthy delay in the Orlando airport, which is not my favorite airport. And uh, there were a lot, I got to witness a lot of meltdowns from children who didn't want to leave the mouse. Yeah, that's understandable. I'm sure you had kind of a meltdown too. I know you didn't want to leave. No, I wanted to leave. I, I didn't, we, gosh, it, it like I'm, I'm on flight aware, like tracking the plane coming in and there's a ground stop going into Orlando. So like the plane oh. couldn't leave. It was in, it was in Dallas and it's just like, couldn't leave Dallas to get to Orlando. So, you know, you see like your estimated time of departure and you're like, the plane's not going to be here by then guys. So yeah. Flight aware is great. It's amazing. I was just actually uh, showing it to a friend who's flying in the town. Uh, they had never seen it. Really? Yeah. It's it's a life. If you if you don't know FlightAware and you travel, like it's it's a great website. Uh, to me, I, I find it way more accurate than the uh, the airline sites. Oh yeah, yeah. And it's it's. I mean, there's a there's a version you pay for, but there's a free version that's got most of the the useful info for for regular travelers and you can um yeah you can see where the plane is how fast it's going what its altitude is what kind of equipment it is how many people are on it pilot's name uh the tail number everything is on yeah, you don't need all of that but it is helpful and then you can also get like i love the screen that shows every plane that's in the air mm -hmm. like you get a screen that shows like and you realize just how many airplanes are up there at once like you know, just like around a big city, it's it's crazy to watch. It's a little freaky, but uh, good good website, Flight Aware. Yeah, it is very good. I am back. Uh, it was a busy week down there in Orlando. It's the only time of the year we talk to all three of the the main decision makers for the team in a two day span. So uh, to me, it's it's one of the the most valuable pieces of the the entire year yeah. when you're covering the team. So uh, I hope everyone enjoyed our coverage of that. Uh, we have a lot to get to today. We're kind of kind of reset a little bit and look at the Eagles' biggest needs now that we kind of shift our focus to the draft. We'll discuss the departure of Jake Rosenberg. We have a bunch of fan questions to answer a little bit later. But, Rube, we have to start with the biggest news. Yeah. What's Landon up? Dickerson got his lawnmower. He did. And y you know that, like, People were clamoring last night for a, for an emergency pod. That would have been a pretty tough one to do. Yeah, I mean, especially since you were on an airplane. That's true. I could have done it sitting in. I was watching like Netflix. I could have done it in the terminal. The day we do a, a podcast in the air, that'll be that'll be a good day. We've we've done them driving to Buffalo and back. That's true. Yeah. So he got his new lawnmower. Um, there it is. If you're watching on YouTube, it's a beauty pro turn 560 Kawasaki 31 horsepower and goes 15 miles per hour forward, six miles per hour when he's backing it up, uh, 60 inch, uh, deck and, uh, weighs nearly 1500 pounds. The price point on this bad boy over 15 grand, but I'm assuming you can get a deal like kind of like a car. That's really sharp. That's a really sharp mower. And I give credit to Landon for leaning into it. Uh, he he posted on his Instagram, uh, showing the full turn radius, driving up. Just look at this. I got me a mower. I mean, credit to Landon for leaning into that. I don't know how, how he's going to use the rest of that eighty-four million dollars he's got coming his way, but fifteen grand of it went to good use. Yeah, I, I don't know if you, you'll ever see anybody like just more at home in, in any sort of vehicle than Landon on that lawnmower. 
He looks good. He looks like he knows what he's doing already. Oh, he was driving down a driveway, so I don't know. I mean, I was operating it, but like I want to see what kind of patterns he's got on his grass, you know, what the cut I'm looks sure like. I'm sure he'll keep updating us. I think we're going to see a lot of uh, aerial shots of Landon's yard this year. Send a drone over. We haven't, uh, does Top Finder have like an NBC drone? <laughs> I'm sure he does. Well, right, let's get a drone over his house and see the patterns on his lawn. Then we can make some decisions. So, congratulations to Landon on the purchase of his new lawnmower. We do have a lot of actual football stuff to talk about in this podcast. We're six minutes in and we really haven't mentioned football yet. So, we should get to it. Uh, some big news from Wednesday. Uh, great reporting from Jeff McLean of the Philadelphia Inquirer. Uh, Jake Rosenberg, longtime Howie Roseman lieutenant, been in that front office for a long time, salary cap expert, is leaving the organization next month. Now, we've talked about Rosenberg before. Uh, I'm sure like loyal listeners of this podcast know his name. I think he's probably a name that the casual fan doesn't know, but he's an important piece to this whole thing. Yeah, he is. And, you know, he... I mean, he was with Howie for, I mean, they were like boyhood friends. I mean, they've known each other forever. Um, he was uh, really, I mean, look, Howie gets all the credit for the the Eagles being on the cutting edge of all things salary cap related. But Jake Rosenberg, Howie would give him credit all the time for the work that he's done in that area. And I mean, he's a really bright guy. I, I think there was a time, gosh, it must have been eight years ago where I wrote some story about how we negotiating some contract and I got a call real quick from, uh, from somebody at the Novacare complex saying, well, that was actually Jake, just so you know. Um, he did a lot of the contracts and, um, you know, they, they worked really well together and, um, obviously he wasn't going to be a GM. He'd like to be a GM and it wasn't going to happen here. How he's GM for life. I wonder how long, how he's really going to be GM. I, mean, yeah, I don't think he's GM for life. Like you do, but well, no. Like as long as he wants to is what I mean by that. Yeah, I, I don't think that's the case either. Oh, I do, I do. Okay, but in, in any case, um, I think his leash is extremely long. But I, I'll never say never on that. I mean, if they have four straight losing seasons, five straight, but yeah, but uh, I think that um, I think that Jake Rosenberg's odds of getting a GM job are better away from the Novacare than in the Novacare. Yeah, and it, it might help him to go somewhere where he can do a little bit more on the personnel side because I, it is tough. Like once you get typecasted in a certain way, like he's seen as the the salary cap guy, the financial guy. Then he comes from that world. He has a degree in economics, like he, and that's kind of his background. It's sort of like Alec Alibi in the front office gets branded as the analytics nerd, whereas like no, like he he's involved in personnel quite a bit. He, he knows how to watch film like Rosenberg has to prove that he can be more than how he's viewed. And I think that's probably tough when you're in the spot that you kind of came up in. Yeah. And I think Howie has always believed that like you can't have one with the other, like no matter how brilliant some, you know, Harvard law numbers guy is that he brings in. Um, it has to be, it has to mesh with the football side of it uh, to some extent, maybe not as far as going on a college campus and, and scouting players, but um, you've got to be able to take those numbers and really put them into context in a really, you know, deep way. And you can't do that without uh, a really good working knowledge of personnel. And, and so you, when you can put the two together, then you're onto something. And I think that's what Alex certainly showed that he can do and, and how he showed he would he that he could do it as well when there was doubts about him and and that's the next step for for Jake, uh, but it's a big loss and uh, you know you have a guy that's been here that long and has worked with Howie that long and Howie values him tremendously. Um, that's a big loss. Yeah, it is, and we're not saying that like the Eagles won't ever recover from this. They're in a really good standing. Howie is still really good at cap management. They have Bryce Johnston, who's kind of. The other guy who's always mentioned when we're talking about salary cap management and former lacrosse star at Shawnee High School. Yeah, Medford kid, uh, Medford, New Jersey. So he's around and and I, I could see him taking on a bigger role with the departure of Jake Rosenberg. Uh, but, you know, it's not just like 
a good numbers guy, Jake was really creative in the way, like we talk about all, all the, the little tricks we've had. Heck, we've had podcast episodes about like the way they structure contracts and, and the void years and all of that is possible because Jeffrey Lurie puts out the cash to do it. But um, Jake's really has been on the forefront of like figuring out how to do a lot of this stuff. And it's not just like crunching numbers. It's doing it in a creative way. Um, the good news is like th it's not like they're barren in that front office. They have other guys who can help fill that void. Yeah, Howie loves to promote from within, so we'll see. I, I would assume somebody will get promoted from his staff, and then they'll hire somebody for a lower, you know, for a more of an entry level job, and then that guy will move up. I mean, Howie really likes to promote from within, um, which is it's smart. It's a good. Uh, it really comes from Jeff Lurie. It's a it's a really smart way to to operate because then got you know people employees think they have a chance to to move up. They're going to be extra motivated to to put in the work. Yeah. Uh, it's something that Jeff Lurie's always believed in. So I, I'm sure they'll hire somebody, but I, I would think that he'll he'll move somebody up from within. Pretty cool story. Jake Rosenberg was in the financial yeah. sector. He was working as a trader, got into football, had a passion for it, worked his way up, has become a really valuable member of the Eagles front office. Uh, kind of similar to maybe Adam Barry, who yeah. was working at Goldman Sachs. They hired a year or two ago, the, the twin brother of Andrew Barry, the, the Browns GM. So maybe uh, I, it's tough to nail down exactly what his role is in the front office, but uh, I give the Eagles credit for kind of identifying non-traditional ways to build a front office. But then I give credit to these guys too, because they're, they're kind of taking a leap of faith that the football world is going to work out. You're, you're leaving a job where you're probably making pretty good money, pretty comfortable, uh, but you have a passion for it and you go for it, which is, I appreciate that. Yeah, no doubt. He'll be missed and uh, be interesting to see how, you know, we'll, we'll get word probably in the next, I mean, he's working through the draft. Um, yeah. So his contract is up after the draft contracts up after the draft. So I think I assume at some point this summer, we'll get word of a little restructure in that office and, and we'll see where we go next. Yeah. So they ha it, they've been very good about replenishing that front office. Yeah. Uh, it's something that replenishing. Yeah, it doesn't get talked about probably enough because these people are not as visible as, yeah. you know, players or coaches. But the front office really matters. And they've had a lot of people leave in recent years, whether it's Ian Cunningham, Catherine Raich, um, Gosh, who else? I'm, I'm missing so many. Like they've had all these people leave. And that's a tricky thing to, to make sure that you're able to find replacements for these people. Andy Weidel. Yeah. Yeah, it's been a ton of them. And um, I mean, how he's talked about how difficult it is to keep that pipeline going. I think he really gets, I think he really enjoys that part of it, uh, trying to identify outside talent and bring them in and develop them and, and find what they're good at and kind of develop that talent. Brandon Brown, I forgot to mention. Yeah. Yeah. There have been a lot of them. GM Factory. It is. Sounds like, uh, sounds like a trend story. I think we've written that, haven't we? Probably. Yeah. Okay. Let's reset. Free agency, or at least the first big wave and the second wave of free agency are over. We are less than a month away from the draft, right? Yeah. It's time to start shifting our focus to the draft. Now, they can still add players without the draft. They might sign some guys. The trade possibility, I think, is always open. But let's try to look at where this roster is with the players on it and then where the biggest needs are on this roster. So let's start on the offensive side. To you, like, what's the biggest need they have on offense and how do you think they're going to fill it? Yeah, I, I would probably say, um, I mean, I think center is a big need. I mean, I, they might have the answer in the building. They, they very well could be. But um, tight end two is not in the building, uh, I don't think. So I think that's a really big need. And I think it's something that they'll address in the draft. But, I mean, we've we've talked about just what this offense looks like with two really good options at tight end and with, with Goddard at a point in his career where you do have to start at some point thinking about his successor and maybe having overlap for a couple of years. 
Uh, but I, I think that's a pretty significant need right now. Yeah, I, I look at the offensive line depth. They added Matt Hennessy, and I, I think that's a good piece. But he's also a guy who missed all of last season, who has had that those knee injuries. You lose Sua Peta and Jack Driscoll. And obviously with the loss of Kelsey, you, you lose the player, which is big, but you lose some depth because of it too. Um, I I think offensive line is a realistic possibility early in the draft. Yeah. And, and, and even like, too. I think tackle depth is, is yeah, a question too. I, I would say I, I think offensive tackle to me is a bigger need than interior line. I would agree. I think they have their center. Most likely. I mean, even if it's even if you're not sold on Cam Jurgens, I still think they have their center. Yeah, I would agree with that. And and I still think that there's a there's a really good chance Jurgens will be fine at that spot. But we don't know that. Um Hennessy really, you know, gives you some flexibility because he can play center or guard, but tackle you you better just hope nobody gets hurt. Yeah, you have Fred Johnson as your top backup. He was the backup left tackle last year. Now, they had kind of the, a weird setup the last few years. They've had like a backup left tackle and a backup right tackle. Uh, Big Fred was the backup left tackle last year. Uh, and look, with Lane's history, he misses games each year. I mean, he, he when he's out there, he's still tremendous, but it's he doesn't really play full seasons. He, he gets banged up, and, and you need to have someone you can rely on. And he's 33. And look, he's still he's still a Pro Bowl type player. I think he was second team all pro. Um, but it's something you gotta start thinking about. Yeah, and we'll get into the draft a little bit later, but yeah, I think tackle is a big one. Uh they brought in uh Darren Kennard, who I, I think they like and will have a chance to compete for a roster spot. But he's also a guy who hasn't really played in the right. NFL. So I don't know if that's and it Look, I, I know a rookie will not have played either, but if you're drafting someone in a high round, you anticipate them being able to play. Yeah. How about running back? Just from a, a number standpoint, yeah, we probably need to add there. Yeah, I, I think that's um, – now, look, I don't think it's as big a need because you kind of expect Barkley to really get a lot of touches, a lot of carries, 17, 18 a game. I don't know, something mm -hmm. like that. Um you know, that's well over 300 a season. Um, they like Gainwell as a receiver and as a sometime back, but um, yeah. They brought in Davis Price from the 49ers, but I don't think we really know what he is. Right. I still think there's a, a fair chance Boston will be back. Boston Scott will be back. Um, if you're him, maybe you feel like somewhere else out there, there's a shot at more playing time, but I don't know. I love Boston, but I'm not sure he's going to find that. Um, Nick likes him. Nick knows him. He's been here for six years. Uh, I think there's a chance he'll be back. And with uh, the, we haven't talked about this uh, with him in particular, but we talked about the kickoff rule. I think he's going to be really good with this kickoff rule. I think ideally you, you end up with a running back because it's kind of like a run play at this point. Yeah. I was watching some videos of what it's going to look like, and I would suggest anyone out there, just go to YouTube and click on like new NFL kickoff rule and you'll see some XFL plays mm -hmm. give you a sense of what the play is going to look like. I think it's going to be pretty cool, but yeah, I think he'd have some value there. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Yeah. Anyone else on offense or any spot on offense? I think tight end, you're right, is is kind of when we haven't talked about enough. It's or or in general, like we've I've mentioned it before, that fifth skill guy whether it's tight end to a wide receiver three, do you feel good enough at, at wide receiver right now? It's hard to know. Like, I th I think I'm really curious about um, Devontae Parker because he's in a position he's never been in where he, you know, the, I think the pressure of being the fifth pick is kind of off. And you he know, was he's uh, 14th pick. Yeah. You're thinking Devin White. Devin White. I, I just wrote about both of them in my ops before. I corrected it before you said anything. 14th pick. Um, but I think that pressure's off, and he's kind of in a position he's never really been in where the expectations just aren't there anymore. Um, and I was looking like 
last year, Julio, um, Olamani Zacchaeus, and and um, and Quez combined for sixty targets. And I think if you give Devontae Parker 60, 50 or sixty targets, he's gonna he's gonna catch you, you know, forty balls for five hundred yards. You you would hope. And I think if he does that, I think he could answer that that third receiver. I think he's got a chance to do that. Uh, I think things change when the farther away you get from being a first round pick, the expectations change, especially if you're with a different team. Maybe he was with a, a second team the last two years. Um, but I, I think he's got a chance to, to help, um, but it's certainly not a lock. I still think they'll draft a receiver at some point. Any concern that most of his career, he's been an outside only receiver even this week, talking to Howie Roseman about him and and Nick Sirianni, like they view him as a guy who can win one on ones on the outside. And, and I think Nick even mentioned, like you know, if 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 we don't have AJ or Devontae for a game, he can win one on ones on the outside. If you're going to play him in the slot, I don't know if that's his strength. And then if you play him outside, that means you have to give AJ or Devontae snaps in the slot, which I think can work. I'd actually like to see more Devontae in the slot, but. Uh, it's not like Devontae Parker is a plug and play slot receiver. No, and ideally you'd like that, but could yeah. Paris Campbell be that? I'm 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 not super optimistic about him. You know, we'll see. I mean, we'll see with both of them, but I think the best most likely the best option is gonna be when you want three out there. If if he can't handle, and I think we'll get a look at him in the slot in camp talking about Parker. And if, if that's not going well, then yeah, you move one of the other guys inside, most likely Devante, but um, you know, you have some options and I, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to put him in a spot where he's not going to be productive. So I think it would be Parker and, and AJ outside Devante inside and see what that looks like. I think that's more likely than Paris Campbell being. I think I'm irrationally excited to watch Paris Campbell. Really? Yeah. I, and that's not saying I have super high expectations, but he was such a fun player in college. And I know it's like long ago. Yeah. But part of me wonders if that's not still in there. And I know that's like a dangerous trap and they can't rely on that. But just me, like looking forward to watching training camp, I'm eager to watch him. I, no, I'm, I'm more excited about, uh, about Parker. Um, but look, anytime what do you, you mean ever... excited about, I'm sorry. What do you mean excited about Parker? I think he can help the team. Okay. I mean, when I say I'm excited to watch him, I mean that I'm excited to watch him play. Well, you're excited to watch everybody in training camp. <laughs> Partially true, but Paris Campbell specifically, because he has, you know, if he still has even 80% of the speed he had coming out of college, it, it's always intriguing to me. Yeah. I mean, look, I think the reality is there's a pretty good chance neither one of these guys will pan out. It's They're, they're both guys who are trying to revive their careers or I don't even know if revive is the right word because they really haven't had you know great careers. But, um, I mean, Parker's got more of a body of work. Um, yeah, I mean, Paris Campbell has one year of production. Yeah. So... You know, his, his Parker's last five years, he's averaged like 688 yards. Um, a lot of that as a starter, which is disappointing as a starter. But mm -hmm. if he can, I mean, if he can give you 500 yards, I think you'll take that from your third guy. Yeah. And a, a lot of like these lower level, lower level signings. I don't know what just happened there. What? what? A lower level. I sounded <laughs> like I went underwater for a second. Spending uh, too much time in Gator World. <laughs> a lot of these lower level signings are really about just making sure you feel the need so you don't reach in the draft. Yeah. And I think they did that on defense a little bit too. And we can flip to that side of the ball. Um, and I, like Oren Burks to me is the perfect example of filling a need so you don't reach. And he's kind of like, you know, they waited till August <laughs> to address linebacker last year. I don't know if Oren Burks will work out. I don't know if he'll ever like play snaps on defense, but I feel a lot better about adding him in March than I do 
waking up in August and going, uh oh, we better find someone who can play. Yeah. I still think they they have some questions at linebacker. I mean, I think that's you know, because we don't know what to expect from Devin White. We don't know what to expect from Nicobe. We don't expect from any of these guys. I, I mean, they don't have one linebacker that you can just say, all right, we're okay here. He's a good, solid starter. Put him in 17 games. They don't have one guy like that. Well, let so, me ask you then, is that their biggest need on defense right now? I think it's the biggest need on the team. Okay. Yeah, I do. And I'm not super confident they're going to do anything about it. Um because that's been Howie's history. So uh, we'll see. But, I mean, what are the odds that Nakobe and Devin White can both be above average starters? I don't know if that's very good. Yeah, I, above average is asking a lot. I mean, I'm just saying, yeah, I mean, even average, just can they be average starters? I don't know. I yeah, don't know. I, I don't think so any of us know. Yeah. I, I think we have that. reasons to be skeptical. Sure, for both of them. Yeah, I mean, who has a better chance of of having a good solid season? Devin White, probably, right? Yeah, I mean, I think it'd be unfair to say Nakobe. Yeah, like Devin White has played in this. Like Nakobe hasn't really ever even played in the league. No, you know, so I, I think it'd be unfair to say him over Devin White. Devin White's played enough to be disappointing. Nakobe hasn't yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and sometimes like you look at what you don't know and it taints your view a little bit. Like sometimes you don't know a guy can't play until he shows you he can't play. Yeah, that's like that guy who tweeted to me and said that uh Kenny Pickett is worse than Will Greer because he hasn't seen Will Greer play. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that's not how this works. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. And by the way, I'm gonna I'm gonna backtrack a little. I think it's fascinating that it's probably the the biggest thing I discovered today is that Devontae Parker has been teammates of Jalen Rager, Matt Collins, and Nelson Aguilar at different stops. And, yeah. So that's all. Thanks. So this is my life. Rube will randomly, like, slack me something like that or a stat, and I never know how to respond. And you just don't. I was like, is this working? <laughs> Well, my lawnmower note, you didn't, yeah, I, don't, I guess that didn't impress you. We can't really repeat the whole thing, but I sent you a lawnmower note. I don't know if I even saw that. Social media. Uh, you know what? I think I did see that, but I was, I, I was on my, I, I was on my flight when you sent it and I don't think I land, I didn't land until like 1230 and then I didn't want to slack you in the middle of the night. I wouldn't have known. I don't know if you have alerts on. I don't. Okay. That explains a lot. <laughs> uh, I think cornerback on defense is a pretty big need. Yeah. Uh, like, I, I wouldn't close the door on Avante Maddox. I think they should be interested in him. But even if you sign him, you can't rely on him. Yeah. James Bradbury, I know there's all this talk from Howie about he wants to show he can be the James Bradbury from two years ago. I'm not buying that. I, I'm not buying that he can get back to that level. Cornerbacks a spot they need to add. Even if Bradbury played great last year, you could still be going in the season with two corners in their 30s. And I, I liked what I saw from Keely Ringo last year. I liked what I saw from Eli Ricks. But yeah. I don't think having those guys can stop you from doing anything. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And Isaiah Rogers, I would throw into that mix too. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeff Lurie said that he expects him to be cleared very soon. I think you have some options. You have some good promising guys but you know to at some point soon you're gonna have to replace slay who's what 32 i think he'll be 33 well if he's 32 he'll be 33. But during the season i mean uh yeah so um i agree with you i, I thought kiwi really showed some promise rick showed some promise that he has a chance to be a slot um but if you have if you have the opportunity to draft an elite corner in the first round. And I think this really goes for, I think it's an important lesson that like having Matt Hennessy doesn't preclude drafting an interior lineman. Having Devin White doesn't preclude drafting a linebacker. You know, you go right through every, every having these two receivers we talked about, Parker and Campbell, doesn't 
preclude drafting a receiver. None of these free agents is going to change anything about how they tr- approach the draft. Yeah, those low level ones. But like, I think Bryce Huff does change the equation. Yeah, he does. Yeah, he does. And I mean, they're working to draft a running back anyway. So I don't know if Saquon does, but Huff's the only one. But like, of, of all the, you know, the other guys, it doesn't it, it doesn't change anything. Um, they'll they'll never sit there in the office and say, let's not draft a corner because we have. You know, we have some corners that might be good. He'll never say that. If if that's the best player there, they'll take him. Yeah, I agree with that. And I have no problem with it. As much as I, mean, I like Keeley and I like, I mean, it doesn't mean those guys won't play one day or, or you know, but. And cornerback's a position where you should load up. Uh, outside of offensive line, I think cornerback is a position where if injuries strike one spot, and they strike corner, it can ruin your season. Yeah. We've seen that here. We have. Yeah. So I'd have no problem with that. All right. Let's take a break. Um, We have a bunch of questions you guys submitted on the other side. You deserve a car that thrills you, a car that puts goosebumps on your goosebumps. At Nissan, we got everything from turbocharged SUVs to 100% electric vehicles that will make your heart beat faster. Experience the thrill for yourself and shop your local Nissan store at NissanUSA.com today. Celebrity cook Steve Martorano brings his Italian-American cooking back home to Philly. Enjoy Martorano's Prime at Rivers Casino and Steve's famous meatballs with Sunday gravy, prime steaks, and more. Make reservations at Mortarano's Prime on Open Table. All right, we're back and a uh, bunch of questions. I just have the list in front of me. I thought we got some good questions. Yeah, we definitely did. Thank you to everyone who submitted them. Uh, we haven't done it in a while, so I, we and like we get them here and there, but I figured this was a, a good opportunity to to answer a bunch of questions. So I'll just go down the list. Uh, the first one is from Bombsburg. Uh, should Bucko Kilroy be in the Hall of Fame? Oh, you know, I was going to research this and I forgot. I was going to look into it. Um, Bucko is a great story. Uh, I've told the story about when he called my my landline by mistake. Um, I was just sitting in the kitchen back when we all had phones. And uh, he just called my phone. Uh, Bucko spent his entire career with the Eagles, 13 years. Um, he was an all-pro a couple times, made a few Pro Bowls. But they started the Pro Bowl during his career. Um, he's – I've heard his name come up in conversations. You know, Clark Judge does that Hall of Fame. I don't know if you, you follow him. He does a lot of Hall of Fame, like, writing who's who should be in, who shouldn't be in, and they're, they're pretty high on him. Um, I only covered the end of his career. <laughs> no, I didn't cover his career. But he's from – what do you go to Northeast Catholic maybe? We go, yeah, Northeast Catholic and Temple. Uh, so he's a Philly guy. Um, he was a guard. Um, he was an offensive guard. I guess he probably played both ways in the 40s. Um, but I know a lot of people who who follow his career closer than I did believe he should be a candidate. Yeah, now he did come up for consideration. He was a semifinalist uh, in the, like the contributor category because in addition to playing for his 13 seasons, he was a scout. For the Eagles, Washington, the and the Cowboys. Was he with the Patriots for a yeah. long time? <laughs> yeah, and then he was he was the Patriots GM and then their vice president. So he was their GM for a few years, and then there he was uh, so he was in their front office for a long time. I think he was in their front office when they when they drafted Brady, I think. Uh I think he was out of there by then. By two thousand, was he? Yeah. Okay, but it's an interesting part of this because, like, there should be a way to combine. Like, you have a a career like that as it's a player. Two thousand seven. Okay. Yeah. I'm I'm sorry, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. When when you have a career like that, you should be able to combine the playing and the non playing, right? Like, this is a guy who, yeah, for decades like six decades was a part of the nfl played at a really high level and then was a really high level front office executive not many people like i guess like ozzy newsom is the ultimate mm-hmm. 
Um, he's probably a Hall of Fame GM and Hall of Fame tight end. Not, not a lot like that, but um, be interesting to look into guys like that. But yeah, you should. I mean, it's like you either go in as a contributor or a player. I guess they can't, they don't really combine. Yeah, but I don't know why when you're looking at the contributors, you can't add in the fact that this guy was a really good player. He was on the all decade team for the 40s. Yeah, I think I think you should. I think you should look at the whole package personally, but they don't do that. Yeah. And Al Whistler was his teammate uh on that on with real teammate, but also on the all decade team. Oh, okay. Really? Mm-hmm. Al Whistler has a better case for the Hall of Fame. I mean, he was a he was a a seniors finalist, I believe, this year. Yeah, as 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 purely player, yes, for sure. Al Wister. Yeah. Probably should already be in the Hall of Fame. He's he's in the Riverside High School Hall of Fame. And that's the one you want to get into. That is a big one. Yeah. Go Rams, right? That's right. Jay Flanagan. <laughs> All right. Next uh next question comes from Alex at Philly Eagle 2895. Ever see the Eagles moving on from the link? Yeah. Eventually, right? Lori did mention they have nine years left on the lease, which is kind of crazy. Yeah, I mean, the link is still in really good shape. It is. I think it's aged quite well. It's not quite. It's not as old as the vet was when they tore down the vet, but by this point in veteran stadium timeline, you're already looking at it like, man, this thing needs to go. So let's see. The, the link opened, what, 02? 02, well, 03. It opened right oh three yeah so this will be the 22nd year so the vet's 22nd year what year the vet opened night 72 yeah so by 94 it was a dump mm-hmm. yeah so uh, but i mean there's an obvious difference as who's maintaining it um yeah i think the link is 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 a really nice place but um i mean is there going to be a point where it's obsolete there will be you know, you yeah, want to- probably, but I, I, I think it's aged pretty well. Now we, it's funny because people think we should have a lot of insight on this. We're not like in the stands of the link. I think fans probably have a better understanding of like the yeah. fan, ex- the, the experience of going to a game there, but we travel to all the stadiums and I think it still holds up pretty well. Yeah, I think so. And they've done a nice job of adding to it. I mean, adding different, amenities and bars and restaurants and i mean the head house plaza or the pepsi plaza i guess it is now is is a really nice i mean it opens two hours before the gates so fans have a way you can get there early and hang out there's bands playing there's bars and there's wip pregame show and all kinds of good stuff in the head house plaza before games so i think they i, I think they you know they, look there's it's not ideal it's not perfect it still takes way too long to get out of the parking lot from what i hear um, but I don't, I'm not sure how you can fix that. Um, and the thing is about the link, like, I think, like, why would you need a new stadium? Well, you, you want to increase revenue. How do you increase revenue? More boxes, more suites. I would think they could probably find a way to add more suites into the link without building a whole new stadium, I would think. Yeah, and they've added those, like, seats down by the field level Yeah, on the end zones. So, yeah. like, they found ways to increase revenue without – like really structurally changing the building. But it was interesting that Jeff mentioned that uh, when he was talking about the link. Was he talking about the link though? Or was he talking about the Novacare complex? I think you're talking about the link. Okay. I'll have to go through it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Um, I think it's going to be a while before they have a new stadium. So. I'm always in favor of the teams in the Northeast having outdoor stadiums. Where do you come down on that? Would you would you entertain the idea of a dome in Philly? I mean, you know, I hate domes. I just – I hate them. Do you? I yeah, I do. I just hate domes. In general? In general. I just don't like sports indoor – I mean, basketball. But, um, yeah, I just – I just – yeah, I, there's something about, like – Something about the sky and just the world, and I don't know. <laughs> just I like the sky. <laughs> no, I just don't like football indoors. I just don't like it. Um, I mean, there's some that are nicer than others. Um, 
I think that Minnesota, that Minneapolis stadium was wasn't really nice. Yeah, Vegas is really nice. Was it? Yes, yeah, I haven't been there. Okay. Uh, um, what do you think about AT and T down in Dallas? I like AT and T. Yeah, I actually like it. Uh, but all things being equal, uh, it's not like snow is a huge issue. I mean, it snows like once every ten years, so um, and not during the football season. Usually, after you know, so um, I. I would not be in favor of a dome um, and they cost like a billion more than an outdoor stadium. So I think in, like in Atlanta where there's just going to be, it's going to be a hundred percent humidity and thunderstorms. I get it. I don't think we need it here. Fair enough. All right. Next question. We're going slower than I anticipated. I'll from, be faster. From Scott Over. Snyder. What percent chance do you give Hassan Reddick to be an Eagle in week one? 26%. I'm higher than you on this. I'm up to 40%. Okay. I I think he might end up being here. And uh, it's just because they're clearly not getting the return they want. And we've seen them be patient before. And if they're not going to get the return they want, they'll hold on to them. And, and they'll figure it out. And and if, if, if he's okay with it, and that's, you got to kind of, make sure you don't have an unhappy player, but the return gets greater once you get into the season. Yeah. I, I, I think there is a chance. That's why I said 26. I still think they'll probably trade him, but you're right. There, there is a chance that it won't work out and that he has more value. Surely they don't want to give him away. Um, I still think it's more likely than not that they do move him. Yeah. It's tricky because they don't really have much leverage. The only right. leverage they have is the proof from the past that they will be patient and they'll hold on to a guy and they're not going to trade him away for nothing. That helps. I think that they can look back at it. Like, you know, if a team's calling about Hassan Reddick, they can say, see what we did with Zach Ertz. It's true. You know, like everyone thought we we're going to trade him away for nothing and we didn't do it. I also think we got Tay Gowan back for him. <laughs> and I think, I think Reddick is a pro. I don't think he's going to sit there and make trouble, but it's not ideal when you have an unhappy player in the locker room. Yeah, he might dye his hair in training camp. We've seen that happen before. All right. Next question from Kurt Seifer. I see a lot of mock drafts having the birds taking a linebacker in the second round. Is that plausible with the way Howie has tackled this offseason, or are the quote-unquote experts overthinking? First off, Kurt, I take offense to this because I just did a mock draft where I had them taking – a linebacker in the second round, but you're also right. <laughs> yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised. Right? I think it's like it, it's more likely that they don't. Yeah. But well, with yeah. two second round picks, I I think it is possible. And we've seen it, it's not exactly apples to apples, but in the way they've talked about paying Saquon Barkley, where the pendulum is kind of swung so far one way like there's not going to be a linebacker taken in the first ra- round of the draft this year most likely right. so if they're looking at it and saying we can get a really good player in the second round who's going to be cost controlled for four years maybe it does make sense to do that and that's a, a cheaper way to find your linebacker like a good solid player than it is to go and sign one yeah and i still don't think they're going to get to draft day or at least get to the second round with two picks. But if they do, yeah, I, I could easily see one of them being a linebacker. Oh, that's in. So wait, so you think they won't have two second round picks. So you think they're using one of those to move up? Yeah. Okay. Any target in mind specifically? Not yet. When's my mock draft due? Oh, I got to talk to you about that Tuesday. This Tuesday? Yeah. You're on the clock. This is a problem. Well, we'll, we'll, well, I'm going to have to negotiate that. I mean, I, I send out that schedule. Yeah, but I never got a reminder. Anyway, people don't want to hear this. This is your reminder right now. I was fighting with Orlando traffic this week. I forgot I what I'm doing this weekend. There goes my weekend. <laughs> All right. Uh, next one is from Samuel Brush. I like his, his Twitter handle, The Burning Brush. 
What sort of production do you expect from Jordan Davis this year? Players like him often don't rack up huge stats, but you'd expect a step forward. And if so, what would that look like? Yeah. Yeah. You, you'd expect him the way he played the first five, six weeks. You'd like to see him play that way the whole year. If he did that, you're, you're thrilled. Um, he seems to understand that he's got to take better care of himself and play through some nagging injuries and learn to manage, manage that part of it. Um, but he's going to year three and yeah, he's got to figure this out. He can't just disappear like he did last year. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and I want to package that question with another one from Ed rock 90. Can you see the Eagles moving on from Jordan Davis? If he has an underwhelming season. First, I like, I, I don't, let me answer the first question. You're right. He needs to be the same guy he was early last season. He needs to be more consistent. He needs to take care of his body better. Whatever he needs to do to not break down, he needs to do it. Now, the second part, no, I, I don't think they're going to move on for him unless it's a complete disaster. I agree. He's still a young guy. He's under contract. And he's, uh, so next year I'll have a cap hit of $5.4 million, which really isn't a lot for, even if he's like a rotational piece on, on a defensive line, he'll be here in, in 25. Right. Because even if he's not the player that you hoped for when you, when you picked him in the first round, he's still going to play. I mean, he's still going to be, so you, you might, I mean, the reps might be, might line up differently, but um, yeah, he'll be. Here. Yeah. The tricky part is like, he is a very specific role. And if he can't fill that role the way they need him to, I mean, you don't really have that guy. Like you have some body types, but you know, it's it's Marlon Toy Pelotu, it's PJ Mustafer who they brought in, it's um Noah Ellis who is still hanging around. Like they don't have like they don't really have a backup nose right now. Yeah, so you, you kind of hope that he's able to figure it out. It's there. I mean, the ability is there, but uh, he's just gotta do it. Next one from Derek Weaver. It's my birthday. Maybe I'll make the podcast with my questions. Happy birthday. Derek. You made it, Derek. Happy birthday. Do you think with Kellen Moore putting guys in better space that Smitty has a chance of having a better season numbers wise than AJ and also favorite Nicolas Cage movie? I. I, I don't see him having better numbers than AJ, assuming they're both healthy, obviously. Um, I, I think he can – I think I don't see any reason he can't be a 1,200-yard guy um, in, in this offense. Um, I'd be surprised if he ends up with bigger numbers than AJ, though. Yeah, I mean, AJ's a really, really special player. I, w I wouldn't be shocked. Wouldn't be shocked, but I'd be surprised. Yeah, I think that's fair. I, I do think Devontae – is one player who has the most to gain from the coaching changes. I think he's been underutilized during his time here. You, like you go back and watch him in Alabama and I don't want to just make everything about motion, but gosh, they, they found unique ways to integrate him in that offense. And this offense has been really stagnant and they haven't done a lot of that. So I, I think that, there are ways to unlock him better. And I, I kind of have some faith that Kellen Moore will be able to do that. Yeah. I think that's going to be a big part of his, uh, his, his responsibility. And uh, I look forward to seeing what that looks like, because I, I just think there's a lot more there with Devonte. as good as he's been. Um, yeah. I think he can really be, I, don't, I think he'd be a top 10 guy in the league, top 10 receiver. He's not, not quite there. He's probably, you know, 15, 17, yeah, I think talent-wise, he's there. Yeah, but production-wise, he could be there. Yeah, uh, Nick Nick Cage movie. I, I got nothing. Okay, I'm a big fan of the National Treasure movies. I know they're hokey. Well, all Nick Cage movies are a little hokey, but the National Treasures are fun. I think you might actually like them. What about um, Nick Cave? You sure the guy didn't ask about Nick Cave? What's your favorite Nick Cave? Oh, Raising Arizona is that the one where they leave the baby on the car? Alex, is Alex there? Alex is Raising Arizona. I think that's the movie where they – yeah, it is. Yeah, that's that's my favorite is Raising Arizona. I have actually seen that. You movie. have seen that. Okay. Yeah. That's I, I don't know who Nick K 
stages. But I do know I saw Nick Cave at the Man Music Center. He was incredible. Oh, geez. Incredible All right. concert. Different guy. Next one. And happy birthday, Derek. Next one from Daniel Wood. Reddick for AJ Terrell, who says no? No. Rube says no, apparently. Yeah, I, I, I would want more than that. Oh, I, I mean, I think the Falcons probably say no to that. You think? Yeah, AJ Terrell is a 25 year old cornerback who's still ascending. Like, both of those guys are going to have to get paid. And I don't think the, the Falcons are trying to get rid of AJ Terrell. Yeah, I'd rather to sign a long-term deal. I'd rather just keep. I'd rather just keep Reddick. Would you? Yeah. Oh, I. I mean, if I'm, I would. I'd be interested in that. Getting a a 25 year old cornerback who's he hasn't played up to that level the last couple of years, but he's a really good player. Yeah, he hasn't played that well the last couple of years. He had he had a big year a few years ago, I think. Mm-hmm. But he's kind of like a bad. analytics but, darling, which. Eagles like it's true. Aside from just this player in particular, I think a trade for a cornerback is very much in play. I think they'll do anything they can to load up on cornerbacks. Yeah. Think about the last two times I went to a Super Bowl. Ronald Darby Darby, trade in 17. Darby for for, uh, Jordan, Jordan Matthews. Yeah. And then I know it wasn't a trade, but then Bradbury assigning late so like they they look to add corners later than most teams it's fair okay next one Corey d what is the top three wish list of roster moves left before going into the regular season for agency draft or trade and we've kind of talked our way around this a little bit Uh, i'll give you my three uh high level corner and that could include a nickel, which they need to add. Uh, their fifth offensive skill player, whether that's another receiver or tight end two, and then depth on the offensive line. I'll say three linebackers. <laughs> it, it, you got to find three good linebackers. No, um, I think tight end two. I'll, I'll be a little more specific. Um, tight end two, um, a linebacker who doesn't suck, and uh, and a backup tackle. Okay. So we just flip. I have corner. You have linebacker. Yeah. Fair enough. Next one. Carter Habig. After all these wide receiver signings in the off season, how likely do you think it is that the Eagles will draft a receiver in the first round? If someone like Xavier worthy is around, would worthy be worthy? They didn't say that. I said that. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't think, I don't think these moves will have any bearing on the draft. Um, I don't either, but I also don't think wide receiver is the most likely. I think there are. No, I just mean in theory, though. Like, I don't think I don't think having those players will change their draft approach, their draft mm-hmm. philosophy. So if they if they do like Worthy there at twenty two, which it might be a little high for him, I'm not sure, but um, I, don't I get think the I get why you'd want. It's fun. He's a super fast guy yeah. that put in an offense. Yeah. Um, it's not like they're going to say, well, we have Paris Campbell. We don't need a receiver. No. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but you also have to question, like, is it worth it to draft a receiver when you already have A.J. and Devonta? Yeah. Yeah, but specifically of the, those two guys that they added isn't going to affect it. No, yeah, certainly yeah. not. Uh, along the same line from Sam Lee's 13, if Brock Bowers begins to slide into the 10 to 18 range, could you see Howie being aggressive to move up, or is this too much much of a luxury I'd assume this move uh, would be with Goddard's time as an eagle near near an end, but the player certainly seems worth it. Yeah, I could. I mean, why wouldn't it? Why wouldn't Howie do that? Uh, I don't know if he'd trade up. Well, if he got within a few picks, yeah, it, it would have to be a modest trade up. The ten to eighteen range, like I don't think he's getting up to ten. No, 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 but. If he if he thinks you know move up five spots, yeah, even a couple. Like we've seen him do that. In One five years. spots, I could see him doing that. I could see them being really enamored of him. So, yeah, tight end's a tricky position in the draft. A lot of these 
big first round picks do not pan out. No, I, I really like Brock Bowers. He's yeah. he's someone who's been on the radar for a while. So yeah, he'd be fun. But if they like the player, I could see how he doing that. How do you think Dallas Goddard would react to that? He'd be pissed. But I also think he's realistic enough to know. And he, I mean, how many times have we heard him say that's the business? You know, he he understands. Mm. Maybe it would. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, you do. It's not like you can't play without two tight ends. And, you know, D- Dallas's career has been like we keep waiting for that one year that it, would, it, would, it just hasn't happened. It's just it's that one, you know, like. I think you can argue it would have been 22 barring that injury. Was, yeah. Well, on a like, per game basis, it was. Yeah. But that doesn't. You need more than that. I mean, he's got to play. He's got to stay healthy, and he's got to produce consistently. And um, he hasn't quite done that the last couple of years. A really good player, but um, I always expected him to be a Pro Bowler, and he just hasn't gotten to that level. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, next one, Steve Clef. Uh, a lot of free agent additions. Some are here because they bring attitude, but with fewer vets to set the tone, will the team gel and succeed? Attitude was missing in 23, but so was discipline and follow through. Will it be like 2012 or 2017? I think it might mean 2011. Dream team. Yeah. Uh, so what's he asking exactly? Uh, basically, like how how the team will be able to gel with all the free agents. With all the free agents, and and I think meaning like without Fletcher Cox and Jason Kelsey. To set yeah. the temperature in the locker room. Oh, it's, it's a it's a fair question because you never know. I mean, really, what they did in seventeen with all those those guys was the outlier. I mean, you don't get that. I mean, they won a Super Bowl with a lot of guys just kind of, you know, passing through. You know, the uh, that whole you know with the Corey Graham's and like Arab Blunts and Jay Ajay's and Patrick Robinsons and Chris Long, but they're all really good guys and it it worked and they all played well. They all stayed healthy. They were all late in their careers or in a lot of cases at the end of their career, um, it just worked, but it usually doesn't. Um, and the guys they brought in, most of them aren't going to be in as prominent roles as, as that group. Um, so I'm not super concerned about it. I think a handful of them aren't going to even make the team. Um, but obviously chemistry is something that's important. And um, I always talked about how all these guys are people that they like and, not just players they like. So we'll see. We'll see how it goes. But certainly it's a it's a tricky thing to figure out. All right. We're going to try to get through a few more of these. We might not get to all of them. So if we missed your question, we apologize. This one from Kobe Dog Productions. Who do you think the Eagles are relying on most to take this next step this upcoming season? That's a good question. I have a couple answers if you want me to pause. Well, I think Jordan Davis is a fair answer. Mm-hmm. I went with Jalen Carter on that side of the football because he was really good for half a year and then fell off. If he can be that good, if he can be the the Jalen Carter we saw early in his rookie year for an entire season, I mean, that's going to make a world of difference. Yeah. Well, you know, Aaron Donald and Fletcher Cox, uh, not in the NFC. There's, there's no reason to think he can't be a pro bowl interior lineman. Mm -hmm. So um, I think both those guys are are, are good answers. Um, yeah. I and and Cam Jurgens was the other one on my mind. Sure. Especially because he might have the biggest shoes to fill. Certainly. Yeah. Uh, next one from David J. Are you surprised the new OC and DC did not have more influence on their former players following them to the Eagles in free agency? I figured at least one or two Miami defensive guys – and one player from Dallas or the Chargers. We've talked about this. I was a little surprised. Mm-hmm. Um, especially on defense for me. Especially on defense. I guess Will Greer doesn't really <laughs> – isn't really enough. Um, yeah, he's the one, really. He's the one. He's. We know he's not going to make the team unless there's an injury. And, you know, I mean, we've heard stories about some of the players in, in Miami maybe not – think of the world of, of Vic and he wasn't there that long. So it's not like he had these huge connections with a lot of those guys. So maybe it's not shocking. Um, I'm not, I don't know offhand just sitting here, like what free agents they had, but um, yeah, usually that happens. Um, 
you know, coaches like to surround themselves with guys they know. But, you know, Vic has been around so long. That might not really – he might not really feel the need to do that uh, just because it's like, all right, here's how we're doing things. I don't care where you've been. Yeah, I, I, but I don't know. I was a little surprised, though. Yeah, I, I don't think they were clearly out on, like, the possibility of that. I know they were interested in Justin Simmons, Yeah, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, the one guy, and I think this is an interesting part of this, we talked to Howie Roseman this week, and he didn't want to mention Andrew Van Ginkle's name specifically because he's, he's not a he's a player on a different team, but uh, clearly they view Zach Bond as their Andrew Van Ginkle, who kind of was – a player that didn't really have much of a career before last season. He was about to leave Miami and Vic Fangio talked him into staying. Then he, he kind of plays this hybrid edge rusher, off ball linebacker. Then he gets paid a little bit on the open market. He, he got a two year deal uh, with the Vikings worth like $20 million. So instead of paying that amount to get Van Ginkle, they're trying to like recreate that with Zach Bond. So even though, like the actual players haven't followed Vic. He's having a say in all this. Like, don't, yeah, don't misinterpret that. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think we're good here. I, I apologize to everyone we didn't get to. Um, the last one here, we were asked if the Phillies are going to win the division. Uh, I don't know, but I'm going to the game on Saturday. I'm very excited about it. Did they call? Did they call that rain out a little too soon? Is it raining where you are? Because it's it hasn't rained here at all today. No rain. I think they could have played that game. Yeah, it's but you know I get that, but I'd I'd prefer this than everyone is on their way to the ballpark and they call it. That's fair. Because that's not the first season here. I'm just glad baseball season's here because. After last night, I don't know if I can watch another Sixers game. Shout out to Kelly Oubre. The, 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 last, the last two minutes of that game were, I mean, there was like six just – and I, I, I'm not – I'm like the last guy that ever blames the refs on anything. But there were like six just wretched calls that all went the Clippers' way, in the, like in the last 90 seconds of that game. It was just – How look, much did he get fined, do you think? Nurse or Ubre? Ubre. Yeah, I'm not really familiar with like how big NBA fines are. I think they'll both get fined. Yeah. Um, but I mean, Ala made a really good point. It's like, why are the why are the refs still out here? Like they run in as soon as the game's over, and they just were standing there. Like it was weird. That is weird, actually. Yeah. The whole thing was weird. Like that ball did not, that ball that got deflected did not did not touch Ubre. And the original call was Sixers ball. And they change it. So they're saying there's conclusive evidence that it never touched him. I never saw one angle that showed that it touched him. It was weird. And then, I mean, Max, you can't blame him on it, but he just falls down on an inbounds pass. I don't know. It seems like Matt Patrice is doing some coaching with the Sixers. <laughs> like, I don't know what's going on here. Uh, baseball's back, and I'm excited. Yeah, and I'm so that's what I was getting. I'm just I love opening day. I love baseball. I love the spring regeneration, rejuvenation, starting to warm up. It's a it's a good time of year. Yeah. What's your favorite ballpark food item? I think you asked me my favorite baseball stadium. I've been to about twelve or thirteen of them, I guess. My favorite food item in a ballpark. I mean, I just got to go old school with a with a with a dog. Yeah, it's all I want in the world is to be outside in nice weather, drinking a beer, eating a hot dog, watching baseball. Can't beat it. Isn't that exciting just to think about? Yeah. Yeah. All right. That's all we have for you guys. Thanks for all those questions. Again, apologies if we didn't get to yours. Uh, we'll do that again soon. We're going to have some time to kill here <laughs> over the next yeah, very soon. Uh, few months. Good uh, questions. Enjoyed, so we appreciate them. Yeah. If you enjoy the Eagle Eye podcast, please do us a favor, rate and subscribe wherever you get your pods. If you're watching on YouTube, please click that like button, subscribe there as well. For Ruben Frank, I'm Dave Zangaro. This has been Eagle Eye presented by Nissan. We'll talk to you soon.